Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. So let me sort of introduce this with a, a, a quote from Thomas Jefferson. Um, I think today this is especially meaningful. He said, for if one link in nature's chain might be lost, another might be lost until the whole of things will vanish by piecemeal. And what he was really referring to was the possibility of us losing species that would be lost over time. He was a bit of a prophet here. I think now we are in an unusual time where we are losing many more species than we would have expected. And that's going to be an underlying theme in uh, what you're going to hear. So I actually have a couple of um, main themes. If I don't get to all of them, at least I've told you my main points in the first few minutes before you fall asleep. <laughs> and, uh, and then I can walk away and we'll all be happy because at least I got my points across. So the first one is that evolution, um, which is one of the topics that's near and dear to my heart, is a unifying theory of biology. And without evolution, nothing in biology makes sense. Uh, Dobzhansky was one of the famous people that made this quote, uh, but it is something I think that all biologists feel in their hearts. Um, the second one is that I believe that there is a tight link between evolution and ecology. In fact, there are books and journals of uh, ecology and evolution. Most departments are linked that teach it. And I believe that if we fail to understand evolution, we fail to understand ecology too. So, um, so in our culture where we have people that are denying evolution, oftentimes those are people who are denying ecological problems uh, at the same time. And if you don't understand one, you can't understand the other. Um, the other point is, my third point, is that extinction is a natural part of life on Earth. And, um, but, Human causes are not necessarily natural. I mean, I suppose you could call humanity natural in a sense, but the kinds of things that we are doing now are far beyond anything that's been done before. So my fourth point is that the accelerated climate change that's taking place now um, is wiping out species and is responsible for many, many extinctions that would not have happened otherwise. And these are going to be very difficult for us to capture. OK, so let me go with my first. Uh, uh, model, which is the idea that evolution underlies all of uh, biology. Um, this is the quote from Dubjonsky. I don't. I'll, I'll just mention the part of it, which I think he says in the very beginning. Let me try and make crystal clear what is established beyond reasonable doubt and what needs further study about evolution. Evolution is a process that has always gone on in the history of the Earth. Can be doubted only by those who are ignorant of the evidence or are resistant to evidence owing to emotional blocks or to plain bigotry. By contrast, the mechanisms that bring evolution about certainly need study and clarification. There are no alternatives to evolutionist history that can withstand critical examination, yet we are constantly learning new and important facts about evolutionary mechanisms. Now, Dobzhansky was actually the son of an Orthodox priest. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. an Eastern Orthodox Christian. Um, I followed Dobzhansky's work very carefully. Maybe um, some of you have heard of uh, Francisco Ayala. Ayala received the Templeton Prize a number of years ago. Um, Ayala was a student of Dobzhansky, um, and Dobzhansky himself uh, was very much a theist, and yet at the same time was a, an evolutionist. Now last week we celebrated Darwin's uh, birthday, um, and in fact I was uh, at Pittsburgh Theological uh, 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 School, at the seminary there, teaching a course in theology and evolution. And one of the students brought in a birthday cake with little turtles on it to celebrate uh, uh, Darwin's birthday um, because of the importance that Darwin had. Now, there were many issues that Darwin had, and I think there were mistakes that he made, um, which he openly acknowledged in many cases. I mean, you know, he didn't know DNA was the genetic material, for instance. And um, so it was very hard for him to come up with mechanisms, but most of his models were accepted. Um, in, in the definition that you'll find in the textbooks is that it is merely change. And I want to, right now, at this moment, clearly state that there is a difference between using evolution as that word meaning merely change and what we talk about for biological evolution. Biological evolution involves principles that include natural selection, include many, many things that are not part of the things that we often use in that word evolution. 
So I tend to say evolution with a small e is about change. Evolution with a big e is about the biological theory. And I get very worried because I hear people take the theories of, of big E evolution and apply them to societies and cultures and languages and everything else. And survival of the fittest does not always fit into those models so well. I mean, one only need look at our modern vocabulary and language that we use and say that it is not necessarily survival of the fittest, right? I mean, so language evolution is, not, is probably E with a small e and not with a large e. Um, so whenever I use evolution with biology, it is very specific in its definition, and I believe it should not be applied um, to other systems. Now Darwin uh, had several ideas that you know I think he just made by observing nature. This is an amazing situation. He went out and looked at what was around him, and he saw that there was a common ancestry for life on Earth that species develop uh, variations in form, which we now know are mutations in the genetic material. Um, he went after natural selection, said that there is a tendency to choose things that are best suited for that particular environment, which was natural selection. But he also made the point that extinction is part of natural selection. And if you look at um, his book, you will find this tree of life. And on this tree of life are branches that end here, okay? What are those? Those are species that he predicted were going extinct. So his model called for extinctions. Now, this is a modern tree of life. Um, no longer really a tree, but it's a circle. This is actually a listing of every sequence, every organism that has been DNA sequenced uh, to date. I think it's about, this is probably about six months old. Um, up in the left hand corner is a sequencing gel, what we use to sequence it. I expect that you can read every single one of these organisms from the far corners of the room, right? Um, but, but if anybody ever wants to look at this closely, I'm happy to give it to you. But what it tries to do is instead of putting it in a tree-like format where we're looking at um, things being higher than others, what it, this diagram is trying to say is we can look at the, at the genetic sequence of all these organisms, we can say how related or distant they are, and we can now tell you how, how related they are, but nobody is better than anybody else. We are all in a place where we are similar. We are at a similar level of evolution, and you know, the bacterium that is very advanced and living very well in your gut right now is about as evolved as you, the organism that it's inhabiting. So, you know, so, so, so we don't try to say which one's higher or lower in today's uh, terminology. Okay, so what do the genetic sequences tell us? There are a few things that we've learned from all the genetic sequencing that we've done over the years. And I'm a molecular biologist. I live in uh, genomic sequences. They tell us that the more related two organisms are, the more their DNA looks alike. And the more distant they are, the more their DNA looks differently. They tell us that um, there is a standard taxonomical method. You know the old-fashioned method of going out and determining whether organisms are related is you look and count the number of scales that they have if they're fish, or you count the number of buds that they have if, they have if they're trees. Well, that method was pretty much accurate. And in fact, when we went back into the genetic sequences, we found very few differences between what we found by gen genome and what we found otherwise. Um, we also found out that um, much of the differences that we find from species to species are explained by our genetics. And then that species have evolved special features that seem to remain in that species for a while. So many of you have heard stories of humans that are born with a rudimentary tail. That tail needs to be surgically repaired. It's some sort of a fallback to an evolutionarily distant past when our ancestors had tails. We all complain about our wisdom teeth. Um, it is a fallback to an ancient time when we needed big mouths to do lots and lots of chewing instead of uh, smaller mouths to do lots and lots of talking. <laughs> um, so there were conclusions about evolution I'd like to draw before I go on to ecology. First of all, the theory of evolution is supported totally by molecular data. There is no piece of molecular data right now that does not support evolution. Um, the availability of all the genomes allows us to test many, many new hypotheses that we couldn't do now. And let me tell you, those sequences are available to you. If you want to go look at the entire gene sequence of the fruit fly, it's out there on the web. 
And in fact, the government has insisted that every gene sequence be available in a format where any citizen can have access to it. Actually, anybody can have access to any citizen. So, you know, go play in GenBank all you want. You can actually play with gene sequences um, if, if, if it's what your little heart desires. Now, the final point is that evolution is the unified theory of biology, and you'll hear me say that forever. Um, in fact, my students that come to me from, from public schools in Chicago that have not had evolution taught to them for whatever reasons uh, really don't have good backgrounds in biology, and it takes them a very long time to catch up. Um, so, you know, it's just one of the dilemmas we live in today. Um, but I think that the evolution story tells us something about humanity. Um, it puts us in the context of all of the creation. Um, you know, there's a sense in which we are the part of creation that contemplates and that thinks, um, and therefore there are responsibilities that come with it. Uh, surprisingly, the genetic code for every organism on life is identical. We share genetic code, we share genes, we share pathways with all life on Earth. I think that there are unique aspects to humanity that probably need to be explored, and those can be explored in a way theologically as well as uh, biologically, in fact, maybe better theologically than biology. Um, humans have a unique creativity that I don't think you'll find as much among other species. Um, there is a responsibility, and you'll find some responsibility among other species where they care for their young. But I think humans are among the only species that care for the elderly, care for those who are injured, uh, care for those who are in need. So that puts us sort of in a unique situation as well. Um, all of humanity appears to have started in Africa. So we are all Africans in our hearts. Uh, somehow that was our origin. And we need to recognize that that's very important in our birth story. Um, we are a product not only of our genes, but also our environment. And exactly what percentage of us is genes and what percentage of us is environment is up in the air. Um, there are weird things that are genetic and there are weird things that are environment. Twin studies have shown that you can talk to identical twins who were raised apart and they name their firstborn child the same name. Or they have the same lawn furniture. This was a study done in Minnesota. But do they get the same diseases? No. So shock shocks, things we don't expect to be genetic are, and vice versa. And as I said before, I think we are the part of creation that contemplates, and with that comes a great responsibility. So the implications then of evolution is that creation is somehow ongoing, and there are some that believe that creation may even be eternal. Um, Bulgakov, who was an Orthodox theologian in the 1940s, who well, died in the 1940s, part of the uh, Slavophile school, he asked the question, is there a time when God is not creator? Um, pointing to an eternity, an eternalness to creation. Um, I think there's another aspect that's worth thinking about, and I just bear it in mind because often uh, people have problems with this. There are some, quote, laws of nature. And, and I don't mean here that sort of natural law of what you think inside you, but I mean actually laws of nature, laws of physics, laws of biology that have changed over time. Talk to physicists and they'll tell you that the laws of nature that existed, the laws of physics that existed at the Big Bang, Big Bang, have to be different than the laws of nature are now. And certainly as a biologist, I will tell you that while we know now DNA makes RNA makes protein, probably early life on, on Earth, that didn't happen because there was no DNA. It was probably RNA made RNA made, made protein. So, the, so that's the central dogma of all biology. And that, too, changed over time. And I think that's worth thinking about because um, we tend to think of those things as static, and they're not so static. They're sta static in millennia, but they might not be static when we talk in very, very large time frames. And finally, the life-death cycle that people live, that animals live, that all species live, is actually essential for evolution. If we don't die, we don't make space for new organisms to exist. So death is part of evolution, and it's part of our being life on Earth. OK, so let me throw in now the link between uh, the evolution story, which I've just touched upon, and uh, the ecology story. So ecology comes from the word oikos. Oikos is the Greek word for household. 
And uh, originally, it was meant to be a term that described uh, how we study our household, how we study our house of earth. The household that we live in is uh, therefore something that was studied with ecology. Um, kind of like economics is uh, trying to develop ways to manage the household, so is this ways to study the household. And it was considered to be, even when it was first uh, developed, a very interdisciplinary field. It required uh, collaboration between biologists, uh, naturalists, people who are geologists who understand uh, the rock formations in the area, people who are ge ge people who do geography, who can tell you about what things go where. So the, it was always considered to be a very interdisciplinary area of investiga investigation. Um, Ernest Hackle first uh, found it in 1866. He found the term. He didn't found uh, ecology. And he defined it as the comprehensive science of the relationship between the organism as, and its environment. It was um, interdisciplinary, as I said. The father of uh, modern ecology is Eugenius Warming here. Uh, he, lived, he died in 1924, um, and he really founded ecology as a discipline, and it was because of him that ecology became a discipline at many universities and was actually taught. So what are some of the links between evolution and ecology? I've sort of mentioned a few of these, but here at the University of Chicago and at many other campuses across the world, you do not find a department of evolution, and you do not find a department of ecology, you find a department of evolution and ecology. They're brought together. When you look at journals, there are many journals that are journals of evolution and ecology. They don't focus on one or the other, they focus on them together. So think about it for a moment. Here we've got this discipline of evolution, which follows progression and development of organisms with time, modulated by their environment, selected for by their environment. That's the evolution part. And then you look at the ecology part, which is looking at how the environment actually impacts the organism. These two have to be related. Okay? And uh, that's how most people uh, try to do it. And so I am left with the conclusion then that if we don't accept evolution, we don't understand ecology properly, and we don't understand ecological questions very well. In fact, I would go so far as to say that I believe that the anti-evolution sentiment that we find in the US, it's not actually so prevalent in Europe. Um, I gave a talk at the European uh, Science and Theology Group uh, last year, actually, and talk to them about whether it's a problem there. They do not see the, the evolution problem so greatly in Europe as we do here, um, where here it's as many as 50% of people do not accept evolution. Um, and I think it also has led to our uh, not accepting things like the Kyoto Accords, which were uh, agreements about how to handle pollution and environmental problems. And I think, in addition, it makes us not understand the problems of ecology all the same. <coughs> now, I'd like to put up this picture of Adam naming the animals. Because, you know, if you look at the Genesis story, when Adam is naming the animals, you can ask yourself, what's this story really about? And the ecology part of me wants to say that this story is somehow about taking responsibility. So, you know, what are the things that we name in our lives? In my, in my tradition, we actually name our godchildren. Okay, so the godparent names the godchild. You might not like that idea. Um, and, 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 and I have to be honest, um, my godson's name is Athanasios, and it was not my fault. His parents told me that that's the name they wanted, so not my fault. <laughs> no, but, but anyway, the, the, the story of it is, that why why do why do why is that naming important? Because the godparent is taking responsibility for the godchild by naming them. What do we name? We name our pets. We name our children. We name some people name their farms. Some people name their property. It's all about taking responsibility. And I believe that this image of Adam naming the animals is about humanity taking responsibility for the animals in a way that is meant to be very loving and caring in the same way in which we name those things that we love and care about. Now, um, I do want to mention uh, humanity's role in uh, influencing e ecosystems of life. Um, there are, there's biodiversity that we actually require for life. Um, there's ecosystem diversity where we have different kinds of places. We have deserts, we have forests, we have different kinds of places where life can be sustained. Um, there is genetic diversity. 
which is all about the healthiness of a particular species. A species that does not keep its genetic diversity can be very easily wiped out by any kind of an ecological disaster. A species that remains very genetically diverse is able to survive much better. Humans happen to be a very genetically diverse species. We're one of the most diverse on, on Earth. But when you look at organisms or animals that are uh, being made extinct, like elephants, um, they actually have very little diversity left. Most of them are related to each other because there are so few that they are mating together. And what happens when that, when, when, when that situation exists, all it takes is one environmental problem and they will be totally wiped out. So genetic diversity is very important for us. And then finally, um, there's also the diversity of many different species because whether you know it or not, we actually exchange DNA with lots of other species. You have bacteria that make up probably as many cells in your body as your own human cells do. And you exchange DNA with them all the time. Um, and sometimes they get incorporated into our egg cells and sperm cells and get passed on to the offspring. And we can't, we can't, we learn to need it. Um, we have viruses that pop from one person to another and carry DNA with them. So there's a genetic diversity that comes from having species diversity here on Earth. Um, so all of these uh, interface with each other, and we have many, many components to um, things that lead to this uh, uh, biodiversity. I want to tell the story, and perhaps many of you have heard this story already, uh, but it's the story of how uh, China waged war on the sparrows. Um, has anybody here heard this story before? I have. So a few people have heard it. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll repeat it again in your second time. You can correct me if I make mistakes. Sorry about that. Okay, so, so the story um, with China was that um, China had actually developed a lot of agricultural techniques. These are back in the 1950s and 60s, early 60s. They were under communism. They had developed a lot of techniques that were not really scientific. They were based on Soviet science, which was not um, accurate and often was being used to uh, sell the politics of communism rather than to be truly scientific. So Lysenko had ideas about um, inheritance of non-genetic traits and things like that that people accepted. So they put in new types of agricultural techniques in China, and these were not successful. They were not producing enough crops to feed the population, which was large. And what happened was, the one thing they observed was that when they planted seeds, the sparrows came and ate the seeds. As sparrows always do, always have, and probably always will, okay? But they decided in China that they would put all the human anger at the famine against the sparrows. And they actually went out and killed sparrows. They called it the War of the Sparrows. And uh, here's a poster where they're telling children, go out and kill sparrows. It's your duty for the fatherland. Here is a man who's actually taking sparrows that have been killed and holding them up and praising these children. Um, and at the end of it, uh, well, let me show you this next picture. Here we have a uh, cart going through the city carrying dead sparrows with it in order to show people how successful their work had been. But at the end of it, oh sorry, at the end of it, Shanghai alone had killed almost 200,000 sparrows. In Beijing it was 310. In all of China it was up to 8 million sparrows had been killed. Okay? Now you think this is like a minor thing and is not going to have a big impact. But what's the problem? Sparrows eat locusts. If you have no sparrows around, you have lots and lots of locusts. What do locusts do? Locusts destroy crops. So now, the famine was much worse than it ever could have been before. They had a 15% decrease in grain production. Famine lived all over the place in China, all because, all brought about in part by these bad farming practices, but made much, much worse by the war of the sparrows. So just when you think that things are not intricately connected, think about this story. All you do is knock out one bird type, and now all the grain is decreased by 15% in a huge country like China. One little link, and look at the damage that's done. 
So think for a moment about then our dependence upon so many species and what happens when species are wiped out. It's a very frightening thing to think how weak these links actually are. Now I want to mention a story that is here closer to home. It's the story of the uh, white-footed deer mouse. So this mouse down at the bottom, this ugly mouse, is the mouse that lives in our homes here. Okay? It's mus musculus. It, uh, it's the domestic mouse. And I think it's not so pretty. Okay? This was the paramiscus mouse, which is the white-footed deer mouse. Lives mostly in fields. Used to live a lot here in the city of Chicago. They did a study, and we're able to show that in different parts of Chicago, years ago, we had a lot of these paramiscus white-footed deer mice. Very few of the red color here, which are the most musculus. But over time, as we put in more pavement, less field, and particularly less trees, because deer-footed white mice, white-footed deer mice, actually like to have trees to be around, the entire population changed, and now there are almost no of none of the white-footed deer mice here in uh, the Chicago area. You can still find them out in the suburbs uh, occasionally, but they're very rare compared to um, Mus musculus, the standard mouse uh, that we have everywhere. It just shows how human influence, without knowing it, we changed the species in, in our own area in a matter of about 30 or 40 years. OK. Uh, how much? How long do I have? To 115, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so, so let me mention something about global climate change and extinctions um, that I think uh, relates to this. So first of all, um, loss of species means that we're going to have loss of genetic diversity. And there is this, in, this dependence that we have of species where we share genes, but we share lots of other things. I mean, you know, humans actually have pieces of pumpkin, pumpkin genome are in our genomes, okay? Nobody knows why, but we have them. Okay. Um, so, that, so there are weird things that we that if we we picked up over time that we don't understand, um, and we do know that there is this need for genetic diversity in life, and the global climate change is probably going to limit human genetic diversity in the end, maybe because it's going to make for certain kinds of people to survive better in certain environments, but also it's going to give us less of a gene pool in the rest of the non-human population to draw from in uh, recombining and exchanging DNA with us. So here's the relative number of named species that currently exist. Um, huge number of uh, insects, invertebrates. Um, there's actually a huge diversity here that exists on Earth. Um, with time, we are losing many of these species. So frogs, for instance, are being wiped out, and amphibians are especially vulnerable. Why? Because, because amphibians have two habitats, right? They live in water, and they live on land both. And so the chances of one or the other being affected badly are, are terrible, and that's why we're losing amphibians almost first before we lose anything else. Um, there are other species that are being wiped out, and this is an estimate of the species in the fossil record that we've lost here. Um, so if this is all relative numbers. This is the recent past, the known extinctions, and this is what the model future is, that we're going to lose 10,000, even up as high as 100,000 species um, in, in really a very short time. If we plot the uh, rate of extinction of species, we see that around 1900 it started to go up, but it's gone up dramatically. In, uh, in, in just this is just since 2000, and actually now it even shoots up much higher. So the rate of extinction is going up much beyond what was occurring naturally before, and appears to involve uh, human intervention. Yo know, Wilson, who uh, I think has been a prophet in many cases. I don't agree with everything he said, but I think he's said some things that are very wise. He said that we are losing 30,000 species a year. Um, and probably that number is going up. Um, that the cause of it, according to his numbers, is human activity. But if you read actually the latest reports out of the scientific community, um, they're 95% certain that human activity is killing species. So there's not a disagreement among the scientists about this issue. 
It is really just about politics and politicians that seem to not be able to get the message. Um, human consumption is 40% of our global net productivity. And we now appear to be the major cause of species extinction as far as most people would claim. Now let me just sh type, share a couple stories with you. Um, these are all from the literature, from the scientific literature. <coughs> uh, Malcolm and his group reported that uh, species extin extinctions were happening in the tropics and that human activity was causing more extinctions than even deforestation was. So other global warming activity was worse than the human deforestation of, uh, of the areas. Uh, Pounds reported that there were 67 species lost of 110 different frog species. Um, and this was caused because there was a pathogen outbreak. They became infected and they died. Um, Sonervo reported that in 1875, 12% of the lizards that were alive then, they're now lost now today. And lizards are species that are pretty resilient and usually are among the last species that we lose. He believes that we, they may reach 39% globally by 2080. Um, that's with a very resilient type of species. Another interesting uh, story has been the loss of the bees, which I'm sure many of you have seen. It's been kind of on the media. But there's actually a, um, a, a side part to this story that's also important. So why are bees so important to us? Bees are important because they're pollinators. They pollinate our crops. Okay? So absence of bees means that we're not going to get as good pollination as we usually do. The question is, are there going to be other species that rise up to be pollinators? Well, in Britain and Netherlands, what they've been able to show is that the bees are not being replaced by other pollinators. This is not a giant pollinator coming out there. <laughs> um, bees are not being replaced by pollinators. They're being replaced by serpents, which are um, like, uh, flies. They're these kind of nasty flies that uh, fly around. And those are not pollinators. So what's happening is not only are we losing bees, but we're replacing, they're being replaced by species that are not capable of pollination. This is going to affect, affect our crops long term, uh, probably for a very long time. And trying to salvage the bees is a big effort now, but whether or not they're going to be able to bring them back to the point where they were before, I think it's going to be very questionable whether that's going to be possible. So what is the, what are the implications for uh, this catastrophic species loss? First of all, um, I think it's so great that we're going to be losing species for sure, and it's going to happen either by infection or by uh, predatory species that come in to play. And that seems to be the case. We see that some predatory species are being lost and new ones are popping in. Uh, in my home area in Ohio, uh, they lost uh, a lot of the wolves that were predator species, and now the hawks have stepped in to be predators instead. Um, and they are so predatory without being stopped by anything that they're killing out uh, huge numbers of rodent species from the area. Um, you might think, oh, well, you know, less rodents isn't that good news. But actually, rodents do a lot of good things as well. And, uh, and, and so it, it can be very difficult. Um, there are the worries about sustaining food supplies. As I mentioned, with pollinators uh, being lost, maintaining our crops is going to be a difficulty. In China, there is that story with the sparrows where major crops were lost because of uh, you know, locusts. And certainly as pollinators move out, species like locusts, like serpents, move in and take over. And um, most of this is, is that it happened before was occurred naturally. It was a very low level type of extinction. What we're seeing now is a massive kind of extinction that appears uh, to be related um, to uh, our loss. Now, I want to go to the point of maybe bringing in some theological concepts that, um, that I think about anyway, that somehow relate to some of these things. Um, and I, I guess I'd like to uh, use this as the chance to maybe bring up some perspectives. So one of, one of my favorite theologians, as I mentioned before, was Sergei Bogakov. And he talks about um, Maybe our perspectives on uh, how we are viewing creation are not quite right. 
he accepted evolution, um, but he said it's not just evolution that's important. He said, the stumbling block for contemporary thought is that the history of the world preserves traces, neither of Eden nor of the perfection of the original man, which is why the biblical story is considered only a naive legend. What should one's attitude be toward the story in the face of the existing critique? One can say that the remembrance of the Edenic state and God's garden is nevertheless preserved in the secret recesses of our subconsciousness as an obscure amnesis of another being. So what Bulgakov is saying here is, fine, throw out the story of Eden. There's no problem. It is just a story after all. But aren't there things in that story that we should be learning about, that we should be seeing at least as a theology rather than trucking it all out? And there's a sense in which what he's trying to say is maybe burn, burn somehow in our hearts is this idea that we are better than what we currently live and what we currently are, that we are meant to be something more than we are. Um, and I think that that is a message that we might be able to find from the story. Um, certainly we know that, uh, that there are some things about evolution that we can embrace. There are ideas that creation is continual. You can find these in the ancient church fathers. I heard the ancient Christianity group that's meeting. Um, you know, Basil the Great certainly talked about a continual evolution in his models. So there are many, many uh, ancient texts that can be used to sort of you know, lift up a bit and show that, they're, they're, that evolution is not all bad. Um, certainly it was it was evolution was defined in biological systems, and I believe many opponents of it are upset not so much with biological evolution, but they're upset with its applications to culture and to society. And they get worried that you know if we believe in evolution, then we believe in uh, survival of the fittest in our society and our culture, and suddenly we become people that want eugenics. I don't think that's what the point of it is. The point is to apply it to biology, not to culture, not to society, not to everything else. Um, there are others that tell me that they hate evolution because it is a materialist view, because it doesn't put God into the story, and it's just about the material. It only talks about our evolution as material. And you know what? As a scientist that studies evolution, I'm actually happy for that. I tell you, if, if some of my colleagues put their God into the story, I'm not sure I'd like it so much. Um, you know, it, I think that we have to leave the putting the God into the story into the theologians and not leave that with the scientists. I don't think scientists see it as their area of expertise. And frankly, it, it, I mean, from where most of them stand, I would be scared to see what the story would look like. <laughs> Honestly, um, there are people that have problems with evolution because it involves issues of chance. And how could it be that humanity came about by chance? How could it be that all these things happened by chance? And I'll, I'll tell you, that your body would not function without chance. Right now, how does your body fight the gazillion infections it might get in its, in its lifetime? Because there is a chance mutation changing in the way in which your antibody genes change over time and are selected to bind to the right pathogen. And if you don't have that, you know what? You die. Without it, you die. So chance operates in nature, and it works very successfully, and we can embrace it because there's a beauty in how it works. So why should we be so shocked when we say life evolved by chance? Because your life depends upon chance. And I can name you many other examples of where that's true. Um, and finally, as I said before, these so-called laws of nature can be changed over time, and I think that that puts um, a slightly different perspective on it. Now, um, the National Council of Churches um, who I often don't agree with, took a stand that I do agree with, so I will um, hold them up and wave the flag. They made a comment, this was now probably about seven or eight years ago, where they said, um, we need to do something about ecology. And so they, they wrote in a text something I found earth shattering. They said, we have listened to a false gospel that we continue to live out our daily habits. A gospel that proclaims that God cares for the salvation of humans only, and that our human calling is to exploit Earth for our own, own ends alone. This false gospel still provo provides its proud features and continues to capture its adherents among emboldened political leaders and policymakers. What are they saying? They're saying, you know what? We, for too long, we've sat back. And for those of us, for those in the room who are Christians, Christians were blamed for the ecological problem by 
uh, the scientists. Why? Because Christians accepted the idea of human domination of the earth, and therefore using the earth for our own means. I will tell you from my own experience and from reading the ancient fathers, I do not believe it is part of the ancient Christian tradition. I believe that it is a new, new tradition in small d that has come up probably in the last 200 years and had to do with the industrial revolution and with exploiting our natural resources. Um, and it probably has more to do with the gospel of greed than it has to do with the gospel of love. Okay? Um, there are other texts that you can find. Uh, there is in, revolution, in Revelations, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees. The saints embrace the whole world with their love. Certainly in the Christian tradition, we can find uh, uh, stories about, uh, about sanctifying matter, about sanctifying water. Um, in, in my own tradition, we have, a, we have a, a thing where we bless water, and when the water is blessed, each priest must, must come to the house and bless every person's house with this blessed water to bring that sanctified matter into the presence of the home so that it somehow reminds us of our unity with the matter. Um, John Damascus said, I shall not cease from reverencing matter by, which, by means of which my salvation has been achieved. Now, I only have about five more minutes left, and I don't want to spend as much time. Let me go on to um, some of the other uh, points because I, I, there's a, another unifying feature I want to bring here. So I've mentioned in the Christian tradition where we have these concepts. This is not only the Christian tradition that we find it. You can go to the Buddhist view and see that there is a, that, that the idea of a separation between humanity and nature is actually considered to be an illusion. It's not considered to be real. Um, certainly the Buddhists have been uh, forthcoming. Dalai Lama helped to save killing of, uh, the, of many species in Tibet in recent times. I mean, their ecological movement has been very, very important. In Islam, we can find that uh, humans are considered to be the successors to God on Earth, and the job is to guard and protect this system of life. That, and in fact, forests are considered to be sites that are where you should go to worship in much of the Muslim world. When I go to Egypt with my Muslim friends, we go out to the forest to pray. There aren't many forests in Egypt, but there are a couple. Um, there's the Druze prayer for the forest, which is a very beautiful prayer. I won't recite it. In Judaism, there is a, uh, a, 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 an overwhelming ecology that one can find. Um, it's believed that a person who's spiritually aware knows that they are tied to all the creatures that exist, um, and that there is a destiny that is shared in unity for all of life on Earth. Um, I, Rabbi Moshe wrote, said, said this quote, which is so beautiful, I'm going to read it. He said, one's compassion should extend to all creatures, and one should neither despise nor destroy them. For the supernatural, for the supernal wisdom, that is divine wisdom that brings all existence into being, extends to all creation, the silent or mineral, mineral level plants, animals, and humans. That is why our sages have warned us against treating food disrespectfully. Just as the supernal wisdom despises nothing, since everything is produced there, as it is written, you have formed them all with wisdom. A person should show compassion of all of the works of the Holy One, blessed be his name. And finally, in, in, Hindi, um, in, in the Hindu religion, one can also find that there is this idea of asking followers to see God in all objects that exist. So the final point I'm going to make here is that it seems to me that, that this is something that all religions on earth share. This love of nature, this belief in the beauty of nature, the unity of humanity in nature, it's a place where we can all join together. And you know, I'm involved in the science religion dialogue, and if we sit at a table and we talk about, well, this is what my Jewish tradition says, this is what my Christian tradition says, you, we, we end up disagreeing. But there are things that we can talk about that are outside of us, like science religion, and particularly like ecology where we can actually have a very, very big impact. And I believe that we need to pull all religions together to have a strong voice in this discussion. Um, I'm going to end there. I have two minutes left for questions, maybe. <laughs> So um, about abiogenesis, um, like how strong is the evidence? Can we create life in the laboratory and how do viruses fit in? Okay. Sorry, I'm just like, like, One of the questions that require three courses. Um, but but let, let me say, first of all, abiogenesis is not evolution. Okay, evolution yeah. plus biology. So abiogenesis happened before biology. 
We don't have a lot of evidence, but the mo probably the most critical experiments were done here at the University of Chicago by uh, uh, Yuri, who put all the things into a test tube to create life, and was able to at least show that you get some amino acids and things like that. Now, there's a lot of work ongoing trying to get a little bit further in that system. Um, government doesn't like to fund it um, because <laughs> the government just doesn't like to fund anything creative these days. Um, <laughs> But, but, um, but the thing is, I think that, 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 that we will probably see at least some ideas about what the beginning molecules or of the genetic code were. There's a big argument, was it DNA, which I don't think, and probably no people think. Was it RNA, which is one model that people accept, um, and, or was it peptide nucleic acids, which are a combination of um, peptides and nucleic acids together, and that might be a model that's worth looking at. So there's a lot of that going on. So that answers your abiogenesis question. What was the other? Oh, the viruses. Kind of oh, viruses. Specific. So, um, you know, so we, we say that viruses are not life because they're not capable of self-replication, but, um, but that's the simple answer. The real answer is that they're probably someplace between life and not because they're streamlined. And when they enter a cell, they are way alive, and they impact life tremendously. So, so I think if we draw a line about the ability to reproduce, they can actually reproduce. They just need to live in another organism in order to do it. Anything? Anybody else? Nobody else is adventuresome. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you made the point that uh, evolution depends upon death, which is a scary sort of thing. <laughs> Need to think like about it some more. Uh, but how about uh, controlled evolution? Is that okay? You know, you're talking about natural evolution, but can we get in there and get our fingerprints on uh, uh, upcoming species? We're doing it already to some extent, aren't we? Um, certainly, but you know, I, and there's a sense in which that's not evolution in the real sense. Um, so. Um, it's a human selection, it's not a natural selection. So what are the things that are he being humanly selected for? Certainly we're trying to clone a few of the species that have died, okay? We're not at that point, we can make DNA from them, but we can't get much further than that, we can sequence the DNA. Um, but there are lots of things that, are hu that humans are doing that are a little scary too. I mean, so you can get online and uh, find a place, a website where they'll give, help you select your child. You can select for blue eyes or green eyes. I think that the image that is most common is the green-eyed, green uh, blonde-haired baby. Okay, and what they do is they do what they call actually unnatural selection, where they select in the test tube for the genes that are going to give you the right color eyes, the right color hair, and then give you that child. Um, I, it, it, it's not really genetic engineering because you're not putting in new genes and taking them out. You're only selecting for what's already there. Um, so those are forms of uh, human selection that are ongoing right now. And we've been doing human selection for decades. I mean, you know, my dog is a product of human domestication, right? I mean, my dog, you know, and humans and dogs started to evolve together something like 70,000 years. I mean, before we did agriculture, we had dogs as our pets. I mean, isn't that like free food? Um, and that's like a whole other story. But, but so we've been doing that sort of domestication. But what happens there is that, they, that those species that we select for are lack genetic diversity. So even though you can look at all the dogs and say, oh wow, look how diverse they are. They're big, they're, they're big ones, they're tall ones. You know what? These are all really minor changes. And they're actually really genetically very similar from one species to, from one breed to another. Same with cows, same with uh, anything, any domesticated organism. So what we do is we make them be alike instead of making them different. Because we have traits we want to do. And even, I don't know if you heard the stories about the foxes in uh, Russia. So, so there, the, the, there's this guy who's been doing these experiments where he's domesticating these foxes. You go to a website and buy a domesticated fox, okay? But they look cool to me. Anyway, <laughs> what, what they do with these, with these foxes is they bred them to be, um, to, you know, to be friendly. So you can have a pet fox in your house and you can do it and stuff. But what happened was they found that domestication chose selected for certain traits. So they end up getting the nose, which was long in the fox, is now short, the ears, which were upper, now floppy. And they took on more of the features that we consider to be beautiful, okay? Which says something about maybe we like passive animals. I don't, I don't know. Um, but, but anyways, the thing is, that, so our selection is always lack of diversity, not what we find in nature, for what that's worth. 
sort of, I guess, maybe on that, connected to that last, last point you made, um, you met, had a just sort of almost throwaway comment earlier about how we all come from Africa. And it, it seems to have sort of a, you're trying to make the point that we all come from a place and we're all connected and that, that evolution is a thing. But, you know, there was an ad campaign a few years ago to try to raise money for some, something in Africa and it had models and athletes you know, putting like tribal paint on and saying, I'm African, I'm African. And that's pretty ethically dubious, right? So, like, what are what are what exactly are you trying to do with that comment? And but, human life evolved in Africa. Humans first became human beings in Africa, and even the Neanderthals came from Africa, right. lived north. And I'm just trying to point out that there is a common origin for all of humanity, and that we did all come from the same spot, the same place, the same origin. Mm -hmm. And that now, and it happens now it's what? And, now, and now there's genetic diversity? Or Tremendous like, genetic diversity that came in, yes. Okay. Alright. <laughs> it's a minor point, but it's, it, it just, it's an it, important point. It just, it, it's an important point, it just seems sort of like it has dangerous implications. It's a, to, to harp on it too. I don't know. Possibly. I don't know. I'm one of these people who I'd rather be truthful and just put it out there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, show my, in fact, I'm not a scientist here, but I'm interested in how you draw the line between sort of scientific account of evolution and then how that does or doesn't imply certain theological or moral ideas. I'm thinking of sort of a controversy between whether sort of evolution works by sort of a more sinister com competition or by like cooperation or charity. And um, it seems like, I mean, an argument I like is a C.S. Person is in an essay on evolution says that Darwin incorporates all these ideas from actually English economists into his explanation of like the theory of evolution. He'd like to interpret it among more Christian religious grounds that evolution progresses by love or charity or something. But like, so as a scientist, where do you, how, do you think that you can draw a clear line between sort of the scientific principle and then sort of the theological or moral? or ethical implications of that, or? And so so well, let me just answer your first question about the, is evolution cooperative versus competition? And it, and it is yes and, okay? It is both competitive and cooperative. So there are species that learn to live together, love each other, and cooperate, and then two years later, they hate each other and they are competing. Now it's not that hate and love, but I mean, it is really how, it, it's just how evolution is. Um, I do believe it's really critical to draw those lines uh, because science doesn't test for those things. Science can't test for economic issues, for cultural issues, it, at least not the biology science can. Okay, So um, I do really worry when biologists try to step outside of their field and start talking about all these broad implications for economy and social evolution and everything based on just what they've shown in the lab for their biology. Now, do I believe that there are things to be learned from our evolution that relate to us as human beings from a theological perspective? I think that, that is true. Um, but those relationships have a lot to do with who we are, um, who we do relate to, what our attitudes are toward others. Um, I think the common, that commonness of all life on Earth is, is I think it's a theological story too. I don't think it's just you know, it's not just a biology. I don't know if that answered your question. It, it does. It does a little bit. I mean, I guess it's something to be pondered. I mean, I don't think it's something that you know I, you can just boom. Because even when you do like a scientific test, there's still even if you're trying to say it's minimally, there's still some duty to explain with language. It's going to involve some use of metaphor, and then you're already doing can be doing some heavily interpretive moves. It seems that even at a minimum level, um, which is what persecutes Darwin a little bit, or just go overreaching. Um, yeah, I mean Darwin got in some trouble for overreaching a bit too. I mean he he did, but he you know Darwin was amazing. I mean he actually wrote in there these are limitations. He listed a whole bunch of limitations of his theory, which you know many people did not. You know even now his enemies use it against him. So. Um, I, mean, I, I often hear about that the comparison between Europe and the United States that in Europe 
know, evolution is a contested issue. And I feel like it's always those two areas of the world. But I was wondering, like, what is the reception of evolution globally um, in, in other areas? Yeah, areas? So, so I have a, I, I, I wish I'd thrown in the slide, I have a slide somewhere that I couldn't pull up immediately that looks at where, how, where things stand in different parts of the world. Um, cer certainly, um, the U.S. has many more problems with it than many other places. Um, Egypt has problems with evolution as well, and, and Turkey, it's really a severe problem in Turkey, where with only 20% of people accept evolution. Um, in almost every country where there is a problem, though it seems to be cases where politics is intervening in the situation, and I think in the U.S., it, it's become a political issue, right? I mean, you know, we have politicians saying what, what they believe about evolution or not. Um, so, so um, <coughs> Europe sort of laughs at us, actually, because we are so uneducated and so stupid. Um, when you go to Europe and talk, they just laugh at Americans. Um, in Russia, there is, uh, I've spent a great deal of time in Russia, and I've given some evolution talks there. And I think there's a dichotomy going on now. There are still some old school uh, communists that have problems with it, and some more moderns that don't. But they teach evolution in the schools. Um, they do not teach creationism, for instance, or any other form of it. So, you know, so we can do is look at how they break it down for their teaching, and um, most of the world teaches evolution in their schools, not anything else, except in the U.S. where we argue about what what to teach, and where evolution is often just not taught in schools. Nothing's taught. Most teachers tell me they're afraid to teach it, so they just they stay away from the E word. They stay away from the E words. Evolutionary ecology don't bring them up. But is it? I mean, do we? I went to a public school in a really conservative Christian town, and I was taught the theory of evolution. I guess is it is it really that big of a problem for curriculum, uh, for public oh. curriculum that evolution is taught? So so um, so in Texas, you know, it depends on where you go. For some schools, it is a big issue, but it's more a problem of how comfortable teachers feel. So uh, so I actually have high school teachers that come and spend summers in my lab, and I end up going to some teachers' convention to talk. And and I and so I listen. I, so I, then I go around and I just do my own kind of. Do you teach evolution in your class? Do you teach evolution in your class? And and I even did a straw hand. Hold your hand up. Okay. Now maybe they were embarrassed. I don't know. But the majority of them, majority of science teachers that were in that room, which is 400 people, told them, said that they do not feel comfortable teaching evolution in their school. And so while it's in the textbook. Well, it's even in the curriculum. They're so afraid parents are going to come and scream, and they can't handle that stress. So they've just decided to avoid that, and they don't teach it in schools. And I'll tell you, from my undergraduate students, they don't know. Mm. Now, if you went to Catholic school, there's no problem. Mm. So, so I think it's a greater problem than we know, even if it's written in the textbook. Well, back to the old school communists and <laughs> another culture. Um, there was a uh, Russian, a Soviet scientist named Lysenko yeah, many Russian. years ago uh, who uh, brought uh, many people along his line of thinking. <clears throat> and um, he subsequently, uh, you know, got a bad name. And I think that's where it stands now. But I've been want I, I don't want to go into it. You can go into it better than I can to clarify it. Uh, but I'm wondering if, by any chance, uh, the work he was doing actually involved some epigenetics, although the term had not yet been invented. Yeah, um, so, um, so I teach epigenetics as well as genetics. And this is what I'll say. Um, first of all, there are very few human traits that are epigenetic. Very few. We make a big deal about it, but there are something like 30 genes that are modified by standard epigenetics Period. Okay. Now there are a lot that are modified, but in other means, like by methylation and stuff like that, we've known about for a long time. Lysenko actually predicted, and the example he puts in his book is that the giraffe got its long neck because it just kept stretching and stretching, and its children inherited it from their offspring because they were stretching and stretching. And if they lived in a savanna with small trees, they would all have short necks. Um, and that's that's not ever been shown to be true. And his that form of lysenkoism is um, not considered to be true in any form. 
Um, could any of his stuff be explained by epigenetics? Probably not, because he used mostly complex traits, and it's actually kind of simplish traits that appear to involve epigenetics. I mean, the big example of epigenetics is uh, the calico cat, right? Everybody knows that story. Why is the cat on where only females calico? Because women inherit two X genes, and one becomes inactivated in some cells, and the other becomes inactivated in other cells. Epigenetic, totally random, occurs however it, it is. And so if one is, uh, if, if one is uh, inactivated, the color is orange. If the other one's inactivated, the color is black, and you get the calico cat. But only females, never males, because they don't have, males don't have X inactivation. So it's the standard mechanism about genetics. Um, so it's where there's an inherited trait, but it, you can inherit the orange color on both gene, uh, on one gene, the black color on the other, and only have it expressed in some cells of the others. <coughs> Does that make sense? Thank you. I think we're about out of time. Okay, okay. okay. thanks everybody. Thanks. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.